Ladies and John Cola with OKRod.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. We have a special guest on this episode that I might have on my show one or maybe two times if I'm lucky, times a year, because he is so busy with his wife doing so many things, teaching raw food, education, and doing consults and all these other things. Anyways, today we have special guest, Dr. Rick Dina, and along with his wife, Dr. Karen Dina, is putting on the 2021 Energy Reset Stomach. So I thought what better topic to discuss for you guys today is the four plant foods that will give you more energy. So uh, Dr. Rick, before we get into the four plant foods that will give everybody more energy, you want to get into why are you doing the Energy Reset Summit in this day and age? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, most people when there's surveys and they ask, the majority of people surveyed say they would like to have more energy. Most people are just bogged down with modern living and modern foods and it zaps their energy. They don't feel their best and they'd like to have more. So we've brought together a whole bunch of plant-based doctors, a whole bunch of coaches, uh, John Kohler included. And um, they're going to, you know, the whole focus in addition to a bunch of health things is going to be on how to have more energy and how to have better health. And it's just really important. So that's the theme this year. Wonderful. Yeah. And having more energy is more than just the food you eat. There's so many other things. And that's why I want you guys to sign up for the um, Energy Reset Summit right now. Link is down below. First comment. It's also in the description. It is free, but you've got to reserve your spot right now. And you got to show up to watch. If you, you know, miss the episode, then you can maybe pay for it if you want to see it. But I encourage you guys to show up each and every day. Rick and Carol will be introducing the speakers each and every day. You could connect with them more. You know, Rick has been a good friend for a long time. And some of the information I get and share with you guys on my channel that actually comes from him, um, <laughs> you know, and his, uh, you know, wife, Dr. Karen. And sometimes I don't credit him, so that's my bad. So I will apologize <laughs> to Rick in the public right now because he, he is a wealth of information. I learn a lot from that guy. And that's well, why John, I have him on tonight for you guys, too. We've learned a lot from you, too, John. In fact, we were you're teaching everyone a whole bunch about juicing and juicers and how that can help you have more energy. Dr. Rick, I know a lot of people out there might drink coffee every day because they think, oh, I sleep, you know, I wake up in the morning, I got to drink my coffee, otherwise I don't wake up and I don't have any energy, right? And they think energy is a thing that you could get instantly right now. I mean, why is it important to have energy throughout your whole day, throughout your whole life? All right, so there's a couple of different reasons. And, and you know, when we think about energy, there's many different definitions of energy. We th usually think of it like, how energetic do we feel? But there's, you know, there's the psychological things like, oh man, that dude had some bad energy, man. It's harsh in my mellow or whatever people might say if that term is still around. Or that's some, that somebody has good energy. Uh, you feel good around them. Um, another aspect of energy is our body's ability to heal itself. But we need a certain amount of energy for that. And when we eat, common dense foods, we're using digestive energy to deal with those foods. So number one, we don't feel as energetic and, and that's direct and immediate in terms of how we feel. But then number two, we're also really hampering our body's ability to keep itself clean and to repair itself and to heal itself. And that's a really big thing also. So in other words, if you are finding yourself, you know, you're miserable till you drink your coffee in the morning, or you just can't think or, or do anything till you drink your coffee, not only are you not giving yourself the best in terms of how you feel, but you're really inhibiting your body's ability uh, to heal itself. And I've actually got a couple slides uh, that I'd like to share that uh, are borrowed from a webinar we've done a few times uh, over the years. So we've got digestive output versus healing capacity. So first of all, every time you eat some food, you know, your body has to digest it. You don't just get energy instantly. So there we go. So we're, we're increasing our digestive energy. We're getting up to the top. And then uh, what happens here is when we're eating a lot of food and it's dense and it's taken hours to digest, then we are limiting our body's ability to heal itself. And, you know, this may seem like a really, really simple concept, but we all pretty much uh, learn this early on in life. 
So for example, uh, let me just go to the next slide there. It's not going as quick as it is supposed to there. So there we go. So for example, let's just say you're gonna run in, in a five or a 10K race. Do you usually see people in their cars or at the starting line eating as much food as possible? You know, one might think energy comes from food. So the more food you fuel up with, the more energetic you'll be. And then you'll be able to run that race as quickly as possible. <laughs> Obviously, it doesn't work that way. Most of us discover early in life, if we eat too much and we go swimming or we go running or something like that, we get a cramp because our body, it's not just the blood going to the stomach, it's a whole bunch of metabolic processes dealing with digestion. And uh, here's, another, uh, here's another example. How about you're on a, a Wi-Fi connection in your house and um, you know, everyone shares the same internet connection and you've got somebody watching a movie, another person streaming a concert and someone else uh, downloading a huge file and you're trying to do something online also, like have a Zoom meeting, you're gonna get some cutouts because there's only so much bandwidth in this case that can go around and all of those outputs have to share it. So, so we've got this basic uh, inverse relationship going on between eating and energy. So in a race, for example, you wanna be empty when you start that race. You want your stomach to be empty, but you don't want to have gone three days without fueling up because then you're just burning fat for energy and that's not as efficient as burning carbohydrates for energy. And we can talk a little bit more about that. And then just another couple quick things that I wanted to mention here. So I spent four years as a water fasting doctor at, at True North. And a lot of you out there, I think have heard of fasting and have heard of True North. Now, when you water fast, amazing things happen. We consistently and predictably and routinely see people recover from type two diabetes, high cholesterol, autoimmune diseases, high blood pressure, um, and, and other really serious health challenges in a pretty short period of time. Now there's all sorts of biochemistry that we can talk about, about autophagy and gluconeogenesis and all sorts of cool stuff that's fun to look at. But the underlying principle going back here is that you're not using any energy digesting food and therefore you have more energy left over. So the bottom line is how energetic you feel consistently throughout the day has not only to do with how you feel, but it has to do with your body's ability to keep itself healthy. And that is critically important because so many chronic diseases people are suffering from out there in the world don't actually have to be occurring. And the more you can eat food that's easy to digest, but that gives you all the calories and all the nutrients you need, man, then you're gonna strike that right balance between getting what you need and freeing up your body's resources to heal and repair itself and keep itself healthy. Wow, Dr. Rick. So let me, let me say this. So if you always are eating heavy, dense foods and eating it throughout the day, are you really inhibiting your bodies to heal? And that means you might always still be sick. So we really, we should eat lighter foods and take breaks and do some of the things that you're gonna talk about in a minute. That is, that is exactly correct. And I know that's a little bit of an elusive concept. I know it's a little bit oversimplified. I know it's a little bit philosophical, but the good news is, as we'll talk about in a minute, the same foods that tend to take the least amount of digestive energy, which help maximize your body's ability to heal itself, are also high in fiber, high in phytonutrients, high in antioxidants, full of water. And, and supply your body with what it needs at the same time. And then we can talk about all the, the biochemistry mechanisms that, that go along with that also. Uh, so that's the good news. So what you said, John, to paraphrase is, is uh, sounds right on in my book. Great. And now the other thing I wanna to mention to my viewers is that we are not talking about animal foods today. We're talking about plant foods. Dr. Rick, I thought animal foods have tons of concentrated energy within them. And when you eat them, you can feel all energetic. I mean, there's people eating paleo diets and all these things, you know, and why are we talking about plants today and not eating animals to have more energy? Yeah. So first of all, a lot of people think, you know, you see on ads like on TV, oh, this, you know, drink has protein for energy. 
And uh, as it turns out, we get energy from three places and there's actually a pecking order biochemically in the body. Carbohydrates are number one. The majority of our body cells run preferably on a simple carbohydrate known as glucose. That is preferable. You know, we learned in school uh, 20 something years ago and uh, yeah, probably all of us who've uh, been, been to a, a graduate degree program learned that the heart muscle runs mostly on fat. But even recently, I learned that even the heart muscle runs about 50-50 about mix of glucose and fat. So the majority of our cells want to run on glucose. They want to run on carbohydrates. They can also run on fat, and that's okay. But protein is actually last in the pecking order of protein. Your body will use all your carbohydrates and all your fat, and it'll even convert protein into carbohydrates to use as fuel before it uses protein itself. So animal products, with the exception of lactose and milk, are full of fat and protein, and our body wants carbohydrates for fuel. So they, number one, aren't supplying the most efficient source of fuel. And number one, as most people know, you sit down to steak and eggs and, and you know, you eat uh, that until you're full. You're not ready to fire up, uh, you know, a game of football or go out for a run or go out for a swim or a bike ride. Then you're, you're going to, you know, turn on the TV and watch the news and chill out for a while, maybe even take a nap on the couch. Um, so they're really, they take a lot of digestive energy and, and they don't supply our body with the most efficient sources of energy. And, and they're just, uh, they're just not the best. Dr. Rick, I know some people out there that are, my viewers are probably on a keto diet right now. They're thinking, that dude's wrong, man. We can live on fat. Like I eat like lard and butter and like coconut oil. And like, we could use fat for a few. I mean, our heart muscle uses fat, like you just said. For fuel. Well, 50-50, that's true. About half, half of it. Um, so that is true. So for example, when they say coconut oil is a good source of energy, well, they mean energy, concentrated calories. But then you, you know, you got to look at how much energy does it take to digest that versus how much energy do you get from it? So fat is number two in the pecking order of what our body prefers to use as fuel, carbohydrates, then fat, then protein. So we can run on fat. In fact, when people are water fasting after a couple of days, they're using mostly fat for energy. Um, the body can convert over, but most people find when they do it properly and give it a fair chance that when they eat a bit less fat and add some fruits and vegetables in, and we don't want to have refined carbohydrates in our diet, but when they add healthy carbohydrates from fruits and vegetables, along with the water and the fiber and the vitamins and the minerals and the phytonutrients and the antioxidants as a package deal that those foods are actually easier to digest. They supply the body with the body's preferred source of fuel as, long as, as well as the B vitamins and the other things that go along with the body's production of energy, uh, stuff called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And most people find that they feel better that way and they're on their way to better health. So I would, for anyone who's, you know, hey, you have to do it this way, I would just encourage you to give another way a try. You know, give it a fair chance, make sure you're getting enough calories and not too many and, you know, all that stuff and um, see how you feel. Give it a few weeks. Don't just say you're hungry one day and, and give up after one day. Give it a few weeks, give it a fair shot, see how you feel. And if you really hate it, you know, go back to coconut oil and, and bacon and, and stuff like that. And, and you know, I, I think 99% of people will find they really feel a lot better. Yeah, I mean, not to mention there's so many other benefits to eating plant foods besides just having more energy, in my personal opinion, based on the research I've seen. But anyways, Dr. Rick, I don't want this video to get too long for my viewers today. So why don't we just get into the four plant foods that people could eat to have more energy? So what's number okay. one? So that sounds great. And, you know, and by the way, yeah, I love talking about all those mechanisms. I love talking about all the things that fiber does. It helps regulate your blood sugar, keeps your cholesterol level appropriately low, um, produces, uh, you know, supports the growth of probiotic bacteria, which makes short chain fatty acids and, you know, on and on and on. I love all that stuff. 
but we're just going to kind of keep it to, to energy here. Like you said, just don't want to make anyone think I'm a one trick pony talking about energy and, and that's it. So, yeah. So um, I'm going to start with fruit as a really great source of energy. So first of all, some people get worried about fruit. Oh my God, sugar. Now it is true, fruit contains simple carbohydrates and most fruit is a mixture of glucose and fructose. And glucose is what our body wants to use for fuel. Every, you take every, you know, maybe the heart muscle is a slight exception, but you take every cell in your body, you give it the choice of different things, it will always want to use glucose. So you've got glucose directly in fruit. You also have fructose, which number one can be burned for fuel and number two can be uh, converted over to glucose. And so because you don't have a complex carbohydrate structure that your body has to work to, to get the glucose out of there. Uh, so for example, most carbohyd complex carbohydrates are um, chains of glucose, and then your body's got to work to get those off. In fruit, it's almost pre-digested. You've already got the glucose there, but you've also got a lot of water, and a lot of fiber, and most fruit is actually low on the glycemic index. So you're not gonna run into blood sugar troubles, but you're gonna get an appropriate amount of calories and you're not gonna use much energy digesting food. So it's, 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 it's the perfect combination, little digestive energy, but supplies your body with its preferred source of fuel in an easy way. And, and so I, I would say fresh fruits, number one. Wow, I mean, I, I eat, Plenty of fruit myself. And so yeah, Dr. You know Craig, fruit is so good and gives us the most energy. Should we just eat fruit alone? Why even eat anything else? I mean, I know there's people in fruitarian diets that eat only fruit and don't eat anything else. What do you think? Yeah, well, it, 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 based on what we've talked about thus far, that would be a really reasonable conclusion. It tastes great. You can get enough calories from it. It's, uh, you know, you feel good. So why not just that? Well, number two, I am going to say vegetables are extremely important. And yes, you could argue that vegetables per calorie are quite a bit more fiber rich than fruit. And they do take a little bit more digestive energy than fruit, but you get so much back in return. So there's certain types of fiber, uh, prebiotic fiber that you find in, in fruit has some really good stuff. Vegetables have some good stuff. If the more of a variety we have out there, it seems that is preferable. Um, and so let's see, let, let's first of all, talk about the whole healing energy type of thing. Some people would argue in the fruitarian camp, vegetables take a little more digestive energy than fruit. Therefore, they're gonna inhibit your body's ability to heal itself. But so if you just look at that, maybe there's a point. So number one, I will say that it's not only energy. There's a lot of biochemistry to healing also. And our liver is the primary detoxifier in the body. And many of these detoxification mechanisms, if you look at phase one and phase two of liver detoxification, are actually nutrient dependent. So the thing is, fruit supplies some of those nutrients that the liver needs, but you cannot get the full complement of nutrients that the liver needs to detoxify the body most efficiently only on fruit. Vegetables fill in the gaps where fruit leaves off. So even though you've got a little bit more digestive output eating vegetables, by getting all those key nutrients that fruit isn't as abundant in, you actually come out, you net out ahead by enhancing your liver's ability to detoxify the body. And then also over the long term, if we look at some key minerals, um, sometimes essential fats, depending on the mix, um, those things are more abundant in vegetables compared to fruit. So I think vegetables are absolutely critical for overall long-term health. And if someone really, really just doesn't believe me about this, then here's the compromise. You can juice vegetables and get those nutrients and make the vegetables a lot easier to digest uh, by juicing them. And as far as which vegetables and what juicer, you want to check with uh, the modern day juice man on that. And that's John Kohler. So, uh, so yeah, vegetables are just super important also. All right. Great, Dr. Rick. Thanks for answering that question. Now, the next question is, I'm going to stump you here. I got two fruits here, right? 
One of your favorites. Oh, man, man. Wow. Sapote and have you had Sumo Tangerines? Sumo Tangerines. I don't Deco know. Decopon Tangerines those. from Japan. They're amazing. I don't anyway, think so. The question is, like, you know, are some fruits easier to digest than others if you're really trying to, like, optimize? I mean, mame, like, basically tangerines or oranges. What would you say? Okay, so I would say that if you took the same weight of each of those, the orange would be easier to digest yeah. than the mame. And I mean, who, anyone who, who's <laughs> ever had a mame knows it's, it's thick. It's like sweet potato pie. It's absolutely incredible. But I would argue that if you took the same amount of calories mm. from each of those, like you might just have a little piece of the mame to make up that entire orange, you would probably be pretty comparable because even though there's not as much water in the mame, that's what makes it more delicious and concentrated and dense. It's still pre-digested. You still have mostly simple carbohydrates in there as well as the fiber and the nutrients. So I'm going to say it, it's going to be pretty similar. But the water content, though, man, in one of these guys has to be significantly more than this guy. Oh, it is. It is. That's so why that's the same amount of MMA. Yeah. And that's why I say weight per weight, you might right. have, if you had 100 calories of oranges or one of those oranges, and then the uh, same amount of weight in the MMA, you'd have about four times more calories. It yeah. would probably take about four times more digestive energy. So if you have the same amount of calories, you're eating less of the mame. Mm. So I'm with you. But so you but you could argue if you eat too much mame, you might overconsume calories and then that just takes more energy than you really need. So therefore you might make an argument for the orange. Now if you just ran a 10k like I mentioned before but you didn't fill yourself up with food in advance to slow yourself down and you just got home and you're really hungry, well that mame may serve you better than the orange if you need more calories. Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with Dr. Rick. And the other thing I will say is, as Rick and Dr. Rick and I would agree with, we encourage you guys to eat all varieties of different kinds of fruits, you know, ones that are more water rich and ones that are dense. Every, every fruit is different, has different levels of water and minerals and, you know, fiber and different phytochemicals and vitamins and all these things. And plus each fruit tastes so amazing. So you guys just learned that fruits are the easiest to digest. And then second, you guys learn that the vegetables are next easiest. And there are all kinds of vegetables on the entire planet, you know, from leafy green vegetables to root vegetables. Like, you know, I have one here, jicama. When's the last time you ate jicama, <laughs> Dr. Rick? And then we got some chayote squash, also known as a vegetable, basically like a, it tastes similar to like zucchini. I mean, there's so many different kinds. Once again, Dr. Rick and I would both agree that we encourage you guys to eat all different kinds of vegetables, but are some vegetables easier to digest than others? I could see like, you know, a chayote squash is almost actually technically, it is a fruit because it has a seed in there, but also the jicama is like nice and watery and really rich in inulin and prebiotic fiber. And maybe you can even increase your nitric oxide uh, levels according to some studies I've seen. Um, you know, let's talk about that digestion of specific vegetables, leafy green versus roots versus maybe uh, more fruity type vegetables like squashes. And, oh, we can't forget about potatoes. And if people are cooking potatoes up, man, are those harder to digest than like raw, you know, uh, you know, squashes and things? So that, that's a good question. So you, you said a lot there. I'll mention <laughs> you mentioned, you know, inulin in the jicama there and, and jicama is a, you know, one of the best sources of inulin. And then there's Jerusalem artichokes and other things are good sources. And as far as the, the major categories of prebiotics, vegetables are higher in inulin, fruit tends to be higher in the fructo oligosaccharides, which are, you know, another really important class of, of uh, prebiotics, which means they feed probiotic bacteria and those probiotic bacteria make postbiotics. They're, they're waste products. And the major ones are these short chain fatty acids, acetate, propionate, and butyrate, which do all sorts of beneficial things around the body, help our colon cells be healthy, help uh, blood sugar regulate, you know, help uh, 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 stimulate satiety appropriately. So you don't tend to overeat and, you know, all sorts of awesome stuff. So um, yeah. So, so anyway, seeing you brought up jicama and inulin, uh, just wanted to kind of complete the puzzle with the, the prebiotics and, and you've helped make my point that 
vegetables have some important things that a fruit doesn't. As far as digesting vegetables, gosh, let me think about this. Um, if it's a fruity vegetable, like a tomato, it's probably going to be easier to digest than if it's a slightly easier. And by the way, we should give a spectrum here, you know, like bacon and eggs are up here and, uh, you know, coconut oils up there and, you know, we're like fruits and vegetables. <laughs> so it's like, when I say they're a little tougher to digest, let, let's just, you know, keep, keep where we are on the spectrum uh, in mind. Um, so, so where something like lettuce or cauliflower um, would be take a tiny bit more energy to digest uh, than the same amount of calories from uh, something like a tomato, which again is technically a fruit. Um, you know, then we get into the whole other type of thing, digestion energy versus like the mechanical part of digestion versus the biochemical part of digestion. So for example, a lot of people don't digest raw broccoli so well. Mechanically, there's just an awful lot of fiber in there. Um, it can, you know, not everyone does so well with it. Whereas if you steam the broccoli, you actually, the steaming softens up some of that fiber. And from a mechanical perspective, actually makes it easier to digest. You know, one could argue from a biochemical perspective, maybe not quite as easy, but I'm, I'm certainly not against lightly steamed vegetables. Um, I personally, I think no matter how you can get vegetables in, eat them, steam them, juice them, blend them. Um, those are all good strategies. So Wonderful. again, maybe, yeah, so I don't know. They're, they're, they're all good. Now, okay, then the starchy vegetables, though. Yes, yeah. like about potatoes and stuff. You can't really eat those raw, first of all. So, uh, you know, that's not a good idea. And then, uh, so you cook them. Now, hopefully you just steam them or, or cook them at a lower temperature so you don't form various uh, um, uh, carcinogens that can come from high heat uh, of any types of foods, uh, including plant foods. Um, but most people find that if they let's say eat a bunch of uh, like, like years ago, I used to like making uh, alu gobi because uh, Dr. Karen and I, instead of going to an Indian restaurant where they'd make that, which is basically potatoes and cauliflower, but they put a bunch of salt and a bunch of oil. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we know these are pleasure trap foods, but occasionally we would do that. So instead at home, we just steam some potatoes and steam some cauliflower and um, you know, add a tiny bit of curry powder, maybe a little bit of mushed avocado to give it the creaminess. And, and we'd make our own healthier version at home. But I would notice if I went heavier on the cauliflower and lighter on the potatoes, in other words, more non-starchy vegetables and fewer starchy vegetables, I would digest that better and feel more energetic. So once you start to get into starchy vegetables, you know, you're going up, you're, you're increasing your digestive output, but at least it's still a clean burning fuel. So I, I, I put those starchy things maybe here on the energy spectrum, fruits, non-starchy vegetables, cooked starches, and then, you know, the bacon and eggs and stuff is, is still way up at the top. Right. So I'm glad we're laying this out to, for people so they could decide where they want to be. I tend to fall on the lower end to use the least energy to digest my food um, so I could have more energy for healing and youthing and anti-aging and all these other things I like to do. Um, so, Dr. Rick, let's get into the third um, best plant food to have the most energy. Well, we already kind of touched on that. They are fruits and vegetables in the juice form. <laughs> and, uh, John, you know, you, of course, are the pro in that area. In fact, on the interview, you know, we asked John a lot about juicers and which juicers, you know, do better for, for different things. And tell you what, it was hard to kind of wrestle John down because he's like, well, it depends and this and that. And he's enthused and, you know, has all this information. I'm like, all right, well, what about the average person? So I think we, re I wrestled you enough down to get, to get to the, you know, the basics for most people. But anyway, um, no matter how you slice it, juices tend to be easier to digest than the fruits and vegetables they are made out of. Some would argue you've processed the food a little, and, and that's fair. You have processed it just a little bit. But my, by um, taking some of the fiber away, you actually make it uh, make the, the fruits and vegetables easier to digest in juice form. Now, I'm, I'm a big fan of people you know, juicing for days or, or a couple of weeks, sometimes at a time, as an opportunity 
uh, to free up some of your body's energy, to allow it to, to heal and repair. I don't recommend it super long term because we still want to get more fiber than the juices provide in our diet and, and get all the benefits from that. Um, so I know, John, you probably make juice just about every day as part of your repertoire. You can concentrate more fruits and vegetables in that way and get more nutrients and, and without using up much digestive energy. So, um, you know, juices are fantastic. They supply your body with what it needs and they don't take up much digestive energy. It's like, you, you know, you don't have to give, put much in to get a lot out. It's like putting a dollar in and then, you know, a month later you get 10 bucks back. That's a, that's a really good investment. So juices are, I think, fantastic. Yeah. Now, except for all the work that goes in, I juice like for oh, that's true. I juice, like it takes me like an hour and I can make like five quarts and I vacuum seal it, store it. And I have it like one of those each day for the next five days, but I'll make like two, three different recipes, you know? And the other thing I really like juicing for Dr. Rick is it allows me to eat greater variety. I mean, hey, I like to eat some raw beets once in a while, but it doesn't happen so much. But by juicing beets, I'm getting more beets in me. I mean, the jicama here, this will probably be juiced. Jicama mm -hmm. juice is amazing. I'm still getting some of the prebiotic fibers, you know, the inulin. I'm removing some of the fiber. So you want to talk about that, Dr. Rick? Because some people think, including some plant-based doctors that are online and make videos, juicing removes all the fiber and it's bad. <laughs> what say you? <laughs> All right. Well, John, I know you and I have both looked into this and we've talked about it a bit. Um, so there, there is still some fiber left in juice. So no juice extractor is 100% efficient. So first of all, there's plenty of soluble fiber left in juice. And depending on how efficient your juicer is and if you strain it or not afterwards, there's even still some insoluble fiber left in juice. In fact, I think about that sometimes when I'm on a, a juice only program for a while. I know when I used to make watermelon celery juice, um, I would, uh, you know, I used to strain it and lately. I just haven't been straining it. I'm like, okay, I'll get some more, you know, fiber in there and, and drink it up that way. So um, th there, there's still fiber in juices, but again, I wouldn't recommend that people only juice, you know, you, you, you want to eat. I mean, we should be getting, I would say an absolute minimum 50 grams of fiber per day. Uh, and, you know, you guys can go on chronometer or, or different uh, nutrient databases and, and put in all the food you ate and see how many grams of fiber it comes to. Um, at least 50 grams, my fiber intake is probably, you know, 80, 90, some days, 100 grams or so uh, from eating lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, if you don't quite make that and you're getting a lot of fruits and veggies from juices, I mean, I think that's still good also, but I, I don't know. I, I see juices as valuable food. Um, I know some people are against them and say, you know, you, you get, you can't get any polyphenols and, and other things out of them, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I'm still a fan. Um, and you've made some videos about that. I, I made a webinar about it a couple of years ago. Uh, and the bottom line is still a, still a fan of juices. Not in, not in replacement for whole foods, but mostly, especially when vegetables are concerned, uh, to get more vegetables into your diet. And by the way, John, I hear you too. Like when you make a lot of juice, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort, but it's, it's, you know, it's your arms and your back muscles doing that. It's not your digestive system. So uh, you're, you're getting a little bit of, uh, you know, moderate uh, exercise there and that's good for you too. So that's good output. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I would totally agree. And I totally agree with Dr. Rick is that, you know, if you want to go on a juice pass for a, a juice fast or juice cleanse or whatever you want to call it, juice feast for a period of time, I think that's great. I don't think we should live on juices by any means. I sell them. Um, you know, I sell juicers, but we shouldn't live on juices. You know, I like to think that juice should be a healthy part of a whole food plant-based diet because it allows you to, you know, get more, especially vegetables. I'm not a big fan of juicing fruits. I will juice a little bit of fruits to make my vegetable juices taste good, but then also, I'll juice straight vegetables. I could drink a green juice every day with zero fruits in there because early in the morning or the first meal of my day, I don't want to, you know, have like fruit juice. I want to have greens to increase my greens. And that's the, where I think a lot of people are deficient in plant-based diets. They just don't eat enough greens. I mean, the benefit of greens, I mean, you could keep eating greens, you know, still get more benefits of greens. There's like no limiting factor. Like you could eat enough mushrooms. If you eat more mushrooms than this amount, you're not really going to get additional benefits. But with greens, like the benefits don't end, not that we should eat only greens because now you're missing other foods in your diet, like fruits and different kinds of foods. 
So I really see juicing as a beneficial part. And Dr. Rick, I want to ask you, because I think you know about this, but, <clears throat> you know, um, are certain nutrients better uptaken in their juice form than their whole food form, which in certain cases might make juices even more beneficial, you know, say for breast cancer patients, for example, with uh, beta carotene? That's a really good question. Um, I have not looked into that specifically. Um, you know, one could argue that, um, so, so one could argue on the one hand that you lose some value, some nutrient value from the juices because some is left over in the fiber. And, and I, I think that's fair. You, you can't say you get 100% of the nutrients uh, that you get in juice from compared to eating the whole food itself. But on the other hand, you can consume many times more vegetables worth of juices compared to what you could eat. So I might eat a leaf or two of kale and, you know, it's kind of hard to chew and, and it, you know, it takes me 10 minutes and I get 10 calories. Uh, whereas I could put probably five times more kale in a juice and consume that. And as long as I'm getting more than 20% of the nutrients out of the juice compared to eating the whole kale, I'm coming out ahead in the juice. And I think it's a lot more than 20%. I, I think, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, 70, 80% or so. And then if you, if you, if your machine is more efficient, if you're, you know, kind of nutty and like I am, I, you know, I bought this uh, press from John like 25 years ago. So when we first became friends, I take my leftover pulp and I uh, fill it up in, in these, uh, or put it in a nylon bag and fold it over and stack it up and then press it all out in this hydraulic press to really get more stuff out of there. You, you might be getting 80 plus percent of the nutrients out of the juice that you would from the whole food. But again, you have so much more volume of that food concentrated in the juices. I, I think you're, you're coming out way ahead nutrient wise. You know, here's one example. You mentioned beta carotene. If you see people with really orange palms of their hands and an orange tone in their face and like the their soles of their feet are orange that is when you start drinking a lot of carrot juice i know early on in my uh you know uh, veggie days i would drink a lot of carrot juice when trader joe's used to have it and i turn really orange obviously i'm getting beta carotene from the juice um and and i think a lot of people have noticed that so um even i so anyway i haven't looked in like to the specific level of nutrients and all that, but I think it's pretty safe to say juices, vegetable juices in particular, are just super nutrient dense and it's hard to go wrong. Just don't make that a substitute for eating whole vegetables. Uh, you know, John uh, comes over for dinner with Karen and I, and you know, our bowls are like 14 inches wide and they're about eight inches tall and they're two thirds full of vegetables. And uh, so that, that's a lot of vegetables to eat. And so we think of the juices as an added bonus, not a substitute for eating vegetables. Yeah, I'd completely agree. And the, I think the main thing for, for me about juicing is that, you know, juicing will basically break open the cell walls and some juicers do it more effectively than others and release the nutrients so that they're more available for us. So literally the juicer is helping you, di helping you to digest the food. And especially if your digestive system is not efficient and you don't chew enough, to break open the cell walls to make those nutrients available for your digestive system, they're really not going to be absorbed and just basically end up going right through you and not getting absorbed. So I think that's another major, you know, factor. And then the other thing I want to caution people is that, you know, each different food has a different level of soluble to insoluble fiber, you know? So for example, if you want to get a juice with a lot of fiber, you know, don't juice pineapples. I'm not a big fan of juicing pineapples, although I do it sometimes only has 10% soluble fiber. So when you're juicing pineapples, you are losing most of the fiber in the pineapple. So eat them. I mean, most fruits you're going to, well, depending on the fruit, like cactus fruit, you're going to keep 50 to 75% of the fiber because the fiber is a soluble fiber. It's not like thick pectin stuff, you know? When I juice whole lemons in my turmeric and ginger, the juice will actually end up gelling because I'm keeping a lot of the pectin from the peel and the rind of the Meyer lemons that I've been using lately. And it actually really, it'll get like thick. It'll get like a little like a jelly, like in the little jars that I make them in. Um, so I want to encourage you guys to, you know, once again, juice a wide variety. Um, I have charts and I've done videos on the different levels of fiber that you could get in a juice. Carrots are about 50-50 approximately. 
you know, but I encourage you guys to, you know, juice all different kinds of things and don't just have the one same juice every single morning because, you know, Joe Schmo makes it, <laughs> you know, I always well, rotate. But is that my better than not having the juice if it gets you more vegetables in? Well, I encourage everybody to make a different juice every day with different ingredients. But, you know, got if they got to make the same juice, that's better than not juicing at all. <laughs> got it. OK, absolutely. All right, Dr. Rick. So I think we covered juicing pretty good. If you guys you know, are looking can for I make, juicer, can I make one more comment? Like, so yeah, you sure. mentioned beta carotene and some people, you know, make the argument and there's probably something to this that, you know, you can get more beta carotene out of, you know, cooked carrots compared to raw ones. And I think part of what's going on there is that the cooking is softening up the fiber. And, you know, you can argue that now some of some nutrients, you, you can get some more nutrients that way. You also lose some nutrients from the heat and, you know, where you, you balance out uh, exactly where you net out is hard to say, but, you know, uh, we're fans of raw vegetables and steamed vegetables. But if that is the case, that in some nutrients that are not especially heat sensitive, that you can get more out of them by steaming them, by breaking up the fiber. Well, juicing does that even more. And again, so, you know, people who drink a lot of carrot juice, it's raw, it's juiced, they turn orange <laughs> and then that's beta carotene under their skin. So, um, you know, again, you, so anyway, that's just to support John, you saying that, you know, when you break all that stuff up, when the juicer does that, that may allow us to actually extract more nutrients from the same amount of food compared to eating it whole. Yeah, and then the most efficient style of juicer that I got for anyways, for in terms of percentage of how much pulp is left over, 90%, Dr. Rick. And I'm pretty confident that of that 10% pulp in celery juice, for example, there's not a lot of nutrients left in there, trust me. You could taste it. It's basically just like eating sawdust at that point. And once, but I'm using like the best extraction method that actually I don't even have a video on yet. So, <laughs> hey, we should try that uh, with the, if you still have a press or sometime when you come over and we'll, no. we'll try pressing out the pulp and see I've if there's done anything that. left. And you get, oh. you get hardly nothing wow. even out of that after that. There's like nothing coming out. It's wow, already that's impressive. just dry, done without even having a press. Because when but, I make juice, vegetable <laughs> juice, if I could jump in in my twin gear juicer and I, I turn the screw so it's the tightest and the stuff stays in there and grinds up the most and you know it's hard to push it down because I'm trying to get the most out of it. Even when I take that and put it in my bags and put it in the press, I get like probably about 15 to 20% more yield. So the fact that you're saying whatever extraction method you're talking about, you really don't get any, there's nothing left there, nothing nothing left. much else to get out. That's that is amazing. It's work, but it's impressive. Yeah, I'll we'll have videos on it coming out soon. <laughs> we won't cool. talk about that. Okay, so um, I think we're good on. Oh, and if you guys want to buy a juicer, hey, check out my other channel, discountjuicers.com, or visit me at Discount Juicers. I test all the major brands because here's the thing I juice every day, or pretty much every day. I drink juice every day for sure, usually 64 ounces to 96 ounces right now because it's getting warmer here, and juice is my main source of hydration but I also eat plenty of food as well. Nice big salads and fresh fruits every single day is, but, and some nuts and seeds. Um, but yeah, you could, uh, you know, get a juicer, I test them all so you guys could get the right one for your specific needs and you'll have to, uh, well, once again, sign up for the link down below in the Energy Summit. Rick pins me down more than anybody has pinned me down before on what juicer you guys should get. <laughs> nice. And I'll say this, now, I don't juice that much. Okay, but a few times a year, I take a week or so and just have juice or almost exclusively juice. And I just always love, uh, even though I'm a bit hungry, the clarity, the reset, if you will. Uh, you know, I wouldn't ever want to be without a juicer. Yeah, so, me neither. <laughs> I know John's disappointed here. I don't juice as much as he would like me to, but um, just saying that there's, there's different ways of implementing healthy changes in the world. And it's kind of like, what's the best form of exercise? The answer is the kind you like the most and you will do consistently. So, um, you know, if John and I seem extreme and ideal, just remember no matter where you are, you know, that the path to a thousand miles, you know, starts with the first step. So um, just keep that in mind. Wonderful, Dr. Rick. So why don't we move into number four? What's the fourth uh, best plant food to have more energy? All right, so the, so we're throwing everyone a curveball here. The, the fourth best plant food is not eating when you're not hungry. 
It's actually freeing up energy. Think about it. Once you have enough nutrients and enough calories, or worse yet, you're eating processed food and you're eating heavy to digest dense food and you, you're over your calorie limit, but you're under your nutrient levels for optimal health, what a mess, right? You're using all that energy, inhibiting your healing, and you're not even giving your body what it needs. And that's why most people are overfed and undernourished. But then on top of that, oh, here comes dessert. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll have a piece of the pumpkin pie. You know, I'll have the whatever thing. I'll stop and get a bag of Doritos uh, or, or whatever else when I, when I fill up my car with gas. So you're just thwarting your efforts there and overstuffing yourself. So number four is to keep in mind, you want to optimize your calorie intake and not eat excessively. And the nice thing about fruits and vegetables and other whole natural plant foods is they tend to be full of water, full of fiber, easy to digest, full of all sorts of nutrients, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, most of which are antioxidants and have other beneficial properties be beyond their antioxidant properties. And because they're full of water and fiber, you get to feel full and not overeat on the calories. So there's a built-in mechanism there. But then even sometimes when you want to take that a step further, eat less food for a short period of time, and you can enhance your body's ability to heal uh, even further. Wow, that's great, Dr. Yeah, I mean, I try to do a intermittent fasting every day where I literally don't eat for 12 hours to, you know, give my body a chance to take a break and rest and heal more effectively. So is that a good strategy? Would you recommend people to intermittent fast for a period of the day? Yeah, I think it depends on what they're eating. So I think for your average person eating really dense food, uh, you know, two days a week of five to 600 calories, the 5-2 method or the other common one, 16 hour of, of intermittent fasting every day are excellent strategies to help people not tax their system as much and have more energy and give themselves a break. I think that's excellent. There's a potential concern when you're basing your diet on fruits and vegetables because they are rich in water and fiber and that makes them low in calorie density. You got to eat a lot of them. And think about it, to get 80, 90, 100 grams of fiber a day, that's a lot of plant food. And sometimes people find it challenging if they only have eight hours uh, to eat all that. And so sometimes what I do is I you know, eat throughout the day and I actually think I feel better if I give myself more like 10 or 12 hours to eat instead of just eight, if I want to try to extend, you know, extend my nightly fast and make the whole thing 16 hours. So there's that to take into account too. But in general, uh, starting that most people are overeating things that are too dense. I think intermittent fasting is a, is a super good strategy. Wonderful, Dr. Rick. Uh, I want to also ask you about smoothies. So we talked about juicing. Why didn't you mention smoothies <laughs> okay. as one of the plant foods that somebody should eat? Because smoothies are so good. Everybody has a Vitamix and they Vitamix blend things up and add extra air in there and then drink it and they get bloated. But why, don't, why go. are smoothies good? <laughs> yes. And John, you got to check with John about the vacuum blenders and all that kind of stuff. And so first of all, smoothies are great, especially because they make it easier for people to eat more fruits and vegetables, especially vegetables. Most people, fruit is not such a hard sell. It tastes good. It's sweet. And if you, of course, we, you know, most, most of you know, you, you mix up fruit with, you throw a bunch of greens in there, kale, collards, broccoli, you know, whatever kind of greens you like, even lettuce or whatever, you throw that into the blender with the fruit, you don't even barely taste the vegetables. It's, so it's another great way to get more vegetables in, uh, to have something delicious. If you need a lot of calories, it's a great way to get more calories in that besides, you know, instead of having to chew all that. So that's really helpful. So in, in a lot of ways, smoothies are super good in, in that regard. It's another strategy to eat more fruits and vegetables. Now for myself, I used to make smoothies every single day and I don't so much anymore because as I've gotten uh, further into middle age and my metabolism slowing down a little bit, I noticed that those big smoothie bowls that I always used to make were just, it was just too much food all at once. So then I would just have, you know, a bowl on my desk and, you know, eat some apples or whatever. Um, and and it, it takes longer to eat that way, but I found that I wasn't eating quite as much and that actually helped me 
have more energy because so, uh, so anyway, so smoothies could potentially have their downside there, but um, they, they really have an upside when you need the calories and when you're going from waffles and pancakes uh, to a smoothie, you know, it's a huge step in the right direction and, and it may be appropriate for people to, to keep up smoothies over the long term. So anyway, those, those are my thoughts on smoothies, the, the pluses and minuses. Overall, I think they're great though. Yeah, and Dr. Rick and I would both agree. However, you guys get more fruits and vegetables in you. If you want to eat them whole, great. If you got to, you know, eat them uh, in a juice form, great. If you want to put them in a smoothie, great. I mean, even if you got to cook some more vegetables to get them in you, it's better than not doing it at all. But, you know, my goal is to get them in me raw, basically through the juice form. That's how I eat a lot of the greens that I take in a day, you know, several, several pounds usually in juice form at this stage because I have so much lettuce in my garden like that I gotta harvest and use as soon as possible. All right, Dr. Rick, yeah. so in this Energy Reset Summit you, you're gonna have coming up real soon that once again, you should already signed up for in the link down below, <laughs> just give me your email address so you guys could reserve your free spot to get all the information. There'll be over a hundred, hundreds of different tips that you guys could learn from to get more energy and to reset your energy so you could become you know better in this new year <laughs> that we're into a little bit um but dr rick why don't you share one more tip not having to do with the plant foods to eat this so that people could have more energy um you know from your summit sure so i can actually uh share another slide here uh for that and let's see so this goes along with the theme of what we've been talking about here. So here we have midnight and noon. And then, you know, we've got like the, basically a 24 hour clock. And I'm borrowing this slide again from an intermittent fasting uh, webinar that we did. So here's a typical, this isn't 16 hours. This is a 15 hour nightly fast. So you finish your, actually, no, it's, it's a, uh, Oh, here we go. Someone's going to eat again at 9 p.m. That's going to be their last meal. So the red here means they're digesting it uh, for a while. And then they're done digesting. And then you can see it turns green here. So they've got 12 hours worth of green. But they're overall, they came pretty close to 16 hours. You know, they had a nine-hour eating window here instead of an eight-hour window. Now, over here, somebody's eating lighter food. Right, so they eat at nine o'clock and you notice I've got it gradated here. It starts out red, but it's easier to digest. You know, they had some fruit for dessert and then they're, they're working toward green. So by the time they uh, get to midnight, they have a huge head start because they ate lighter food. And by the time they get over here, you notice I've got this darker green. You know, the, the healing ability of the body is actually accumulating more. And then maybe they make a, a juice or something pretty easy uh, to digest here. And they've got a little bit of red and then they get into the green. And so by eating lighter food around the clock, the total amount of green is increasing. And that represents your body's ability to heal itself going back to those arrows we saw earlier. And the total amount of red, which means your body isn't healing as much because it's busy digesting then is decreasing. And Everyone has to kind of experiment a little bit to find uh, the best mix for them of is an eating plenty of food, uh, but not having too much. And, uh, you know, so, so I guess my final tip with that in mind is that, uh, like John and I were saying earlier, make sure you experiment a little bit to, to find out what works best for you. And if you've got a favorite teacher who does it a certain way and that works great, we're not gonna argue with that. But if that way doesn't happen to work for you, don't feel like you're in jail or you're stuck or that's the only way to do it. Because what happens is if that approach doesn't work for somebody, typically then they're gonna go start searching for other things and they have a tendency to go towards some other extreme and some other end of the spectrum. And, uh, and then, you know, they're doing something else that might not work over the long term. So someone not getting enough calories on a fruit and vegetable based diet, or just being fruitarian and not feeling their best, their brain isn't getting uh, the minerals and, and sometimes the essential fats that they need. And, you know, maybe they become anemic and, and they're just not feeling their best. And then they go on a carnivore diet 
And they're like, oh my God, I'm not anemic anymore. And my brain works better. And even though they're sucking down a lot of energy digesting food, the net effect is that they feel better. Whereas if they were open-minded and say, hey, why don't I get some more vegetables in? Why don't I eat enough calories? Why don't I make sure enough of those vegetables uh, supply the iron that I need? Then they don't have to be anemic. Their brain can work really well and they can be using a lot less digestive energy and they could be feeling a lot better than they would on the carnivore diet. But you know, again, a deficient vegan diet Carnivore diet gets them here, but a non-deficient vegan diet gets them much higher. And so, some, so, so in other words, make sure you're doing it in a sensible way that works for you individually. And yes, take advice from people who have been on the path for a long time. But again, don't feel like that's the only way to go about things. So just like the favorite form of exercise or the best form is the one you like the most that you'll do. The best kind of plant-based diet uh, within healthy parameters is the one you enjoy the most that you're going to keep up for the long term and keep getting the benefits from instead of doing it wrong and bailing out and then not getting the benefits anymore. Wow. That was one amazing tip that worked perfectly, <laughs> Dr. Rick, with what we've talked about. I hope you guys that are watching this implement it. And if you guys have already gotten a lot of benefit from this, hopefully you guys have also already signed up for Dr. Rick's and Dr. Karen's Energy Reset Summit, uh, because you're going to learn so much more to optimize, to get healthier, to gain more energy. So Dr. Rick, you want to go over just maybe a few things, what they're going to learn in the Energy Reset Summit, who they're going to hear from? Yeah, sure. So let's just kind of share that screen again, as long as we're taking advantage of Zoom's uh, capabilities here. So here we have the Energy Reset Summit. We are working with a, a partner this year who's got it all dialed in and, and looking really cool. So we got some information in the beginning here. Uh, we're going to hear from you know top experts um, each day about uh, the benefits of a plant-based diet from energy and for overall health. Uh, here's gonna be someone who looks familiar on day three, fasting and juicing to detox and reset your body. Uh, we have Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who I spent four years with at True North, uh, where I learned all about water fasting. And then a, a, another True North graduate, uh, Dr. Nathan Gershfeld, uh, we're talking to that day. Uh, a lot of good people here on day four, like every day is really good. Um, you'll see, you know, some of these people are more fruit and vegetable oriented. Some are just generally plant-based oriented. We have uh, different chefs like Kathy Fisher. Um, Dr. Chen gave a, a phenomenal presentation about uh, various toxins in the environment and how those affect how our body produces energy and how to avoid them. Uh, Mark Huberman uh, is in his upper 60s, lifelong uh, vegan first 32 years, he's completely raw. Uh, and he's mostly raw since then. Uh, people talking about hormones, um, you know, various other speakers. So anyway, we just have a, a huge array of, of people to share, experts to share a lot of good information with. I'll, I'll stop on this seeing John's there. Um, and what we're doing differently than we've done in previous summits is that Dr. Karen and I are gonna be there live at the beginning of each day. So it's gonna start at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern time, which is uh, 7 p.m. Central European time. And we are going to have a live session. And number one, we're gonna summarize each of the speaker's presentations so you can hear uh, about what's coming up that day. Number two, we're gonna give a presentation ourselves related to the topic of the day. And then we're gonna stay for a while for questions and answers live. So each day is gonna be really full of uh, awesome stuff. And um, you know, I think it's gonna be an excellent event. And uh, we've done many summits before and we're trying things a little bit differently this year with a partner. And I think we're gonna reach uh, more people and get more good information out there and more inspiration and help support all of you looking to have more energy and feel better and enhance your long, short, medium and long-term health while you're at it. 
Wow. So if you guys haven't signed up yet, once again, sign up right now. Link is down below, man. Don't miss out on this. There's so much information that you could gain from. I mean, if you just learn one new piece of knowledge, it could change the trajectory trajectory of your, you know, your health, your life, and get you guys more energy to reset. It's going to be amazing. So Dr. Rick, I'm already actually signed up. So I want you guys to do that as well. So Dr. Rick, before we sign off any last comments or words of wisdom you'd like to share my viewers today? No, I think that should do it. I mean, John, I'll say, you know, Dr. Karen and I are always uh, happy to be guests on your show like this. We're always happy to have you uh, on our summits. We we've had you every time we've had one. And the more fruits and vegetables you can eat, which supply your body with what it needs without sucking down too much energy, you have more energy, you feel better, your brain works better, and you avoid common diseases and can oftentimes even reverse depending on the situation, major diseases that come from as a result of eating foods that take too much energy that also don't supply your body with what it needs, but also give your body too many things that interfere with health. And you will hear so many of, of these doctors and uh, other plant-based experts share how that can happen and how it's not just like some radical, you know, I'll, I'll think about getting better and I will, uh, they will tell you what to do uh, to enhance your health. So uh, we really hope you all join us. Well, thanks, Dr. Richter. And thank you to, you know, uh, you and your wife, Dr. Karen, um, who is putting on this, because I know this has been an incredible amount of work and you're doing it to literally make a difference in the world. So I applaud you greatly for doing that. So you guys that are watching, if you guys enjoyed this episode, hey, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Also, more importantly, please be sure to share this video with other people in a plant-based community and other people that, that want to have more energy so that they can learn the top four plant foods to have more energy. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you never miss out on my new and upcoming episodes. I've come out about every five to seven days. You never know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel so that you can eat more fruits and vegetables and do it even in a better way and get healthier. Also, make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as my new videos come out. And finally, be sure to check my past episodes. My past episodes are a wealth of knowledge, over 600 episodes at this time on this YouTube channel, many with Dr. Rick. I'll put a couple links down below to some videos I made with Dr. Rick in the past so you guys could learn from all his amazing knowledge that him and his wife will share with you guys. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best. <laughs>